Thank you, Victor, so much. Um, I think we have maybe what may be the most unique panel uh, of the entire session, and certainly among some of the most unique people here. Um, I myself, for instance, uh, am a social scientist and a policy person, uh, not an oceanographer. We also have with us today the founder of uh, uh, Google uh, Ocean Program and a very enthusiastic mother of uh, two young children. We have a bona fide high school teacher and a volcanist. We have a Canadian. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and a microbiologist who actually really sincerely cares uh, and is curious about how people learn. We have an artist and an intense, uh, intense, intense observer um, who really fell in love with ocean critters. We have an ad man and the inventor of a 360 degree uh, sea view camera. Uh, and oh, by the way, I just need to uh, make a special mention, behind the scenes uh, helping us set up this entire panel is an extraordinary science communicator and a sea ship webcast addict, uh, Mary Miller. Do you just want to sort of wave and thank you so much uh, for helping us get started. Um, so uh, first of all, let me just say John Delaney. I just had to say that, get it out of the way so that no one else in the panel is tempted to go ahead and throw John's name in there for any reason. Um, but more importantly, I think we're going to try a little bit different format. I mean, we are, of course, talking about engagement. And so I think we're going to try to be a bit deliberately provocative. We're going to take it question and answer, Phil Donahue style. Um, we'll kind of get these guys warmed up and started and then turn it over to you. So we're going to cover a lot of ground very, very quickly uh, and then invite each of you guys to drill down in depth on certain topics that may come on up. Uh, and if we've done our job well, um, hopefully we will have changed at least some of your minds uh, about what this whole very complex field of uh, science communication and learning um, is all about. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And the way I'd like to get started is maybe to go right back to the very beginning of this meeting uh, and to bring up um, the fact that I think uh, Wendy Schmidt really challenged all of us as a major part of the mission of this conference and our world to create a caring public. And if you listen very carefully to Wendy and also to Eric, one of the interesting things is about three quarters of their conversation actually had to do about engagement with uh, communities outside of our own. The science was one part, but communication, governance, management, uh, our children and our adults, um, our seed corn, if you want to think of it that way, um, really has been sort of um, a big part of their challenge to all of us. And let me just say for the record that this is as serious a field of endeavor uh, and research as any other. The social science, social psychology, cognition, economics, political science, uh, I'm a political economist myself, um, that uh, boy, if you think uh, invertebrates uh, are a difficult thing to study, you really ought to get involved in uh, what actually constitutes human learning and human behavior. Uh, but that is in essence what we're talking about here today. So uh, what I'd like to start with, uh, perhaps, uh, just to get us warmed up uh, and get a good start, you know, sort of kind of uh, talking about our purpose and our theory of action. If I can have the first slide, please. Is this the most important session? Uh, quite seriously, why is this always the afterthought? Why is this the last panel of the day? Why is this not integrated in an ultimate purpose of all of your work? Um, it really, uh, I think, uh, for a lot of us, um, is a very um, a vexing question. Um, so I want to just ask the panel and help us get started. Um, is this the most important session? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, for me, that was an easy question. Um, as you mentioned, I am an ex-ad man, um, and I think I bring a quite a unique perspective to this symposium and, indeed, this panel. Um, I look at... Uh, public communication and engagement, and I do see it really as the, the weak link. Um, but by being the, the area of weakness, it is also the greatest opportunity. Um, and I am very, very excited when I come here and, and listen to all these talks about the opportunity that communication can offer. Um, if you look at ocean science as a product, it is a great product. And what's more, it is really, really needed. It's all about communication. And I think Wendy summed it up brilliantly um, yesterday when she said, this is a quest for the most essential knowledge humans have ever needed. 
Now, as an ad man, I look at that um, quote and I see that as a great advertising brief. And all we need to do is sell it. Um, for me, it is quite an easy sell when you look at it, the statement like that. Um, and really, it's, it is the solution, really, to the funding issues and a lot of the issues that you're facing. If we get the communication right, if we get the public behind ocean science, then we solve the issues. Um, just yep. on one last point, um, the crux of the issue for me is there's been too much focus on the engagement and the education and not enough on the advertising and the promotion. Um, and that is quite a simple solution. Okay. Who else wants to shout at that one? Uh, what I'd like to add to that is a feeling and a sense of urgency. Uh, we had it brought up yesterday in one of the talks and a number of the discussions. The industrialization of the ocean and of the deep ocean, we're living that right now and there's more coming. And if we're to, and in many cases this is happening to complete ignorance of, of the general public. We don't see it, we don't know it's there. And yet it's, it's slowly ramping up to, to involve environmental and resource exploitation on a scale that we have never seen uh, in the lifetime of humanity on this planet. So there is a real urgency to communicate an understanding of the oceans to the general public and to our funding agencies, to our politicians, to our regulators, and also an understanding of, of what's coming. Yeah. Great, Kim. Anyone else? Jennifer? Um, I'm not sure if just talking is gonna work, okay. All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> technology. Um, I was just going to say, uh, you know, Richard and I have been working over the last couple of years on bringing the image you see right here, um, underwater street view, to a large consumer audience in Google Maps. And Steve Silverman, who's here uh, in the audience, and I have uh, worked on the Google side. Um, and you know, our goal has been you know, to really look at bringing this engaging content to a general consumer audience. So Google Maps has, uh, you know, over a billion users a month. Um, and you know, Google Earth has been downloaded a billion times. It's available in 37 languages, and um, it really started as a project. You know, Sylvia Earle, the big ocean explorer, she said, you know, I love Google Earth, but you should call it Google Dirt. You know, this is about six years ago because you're missing all the ocean. Uh, and we're like, Sylvia, you're right. You know, we're missing all the ocean. And uh, one of our execs invited her to come give a tech talk at Google, and that led to a lot of us working on how you would add this ocean. And we've worked with many people in this room over the last several years to build the map of the ocean. And I think by thinking about how all the science data can get into a consumer product and be accessible and available to anyone is one kind of powerful way um, of communicating ocean science to a larger audience. Um, and it kind of, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is, a, is a potential tool in the arsenal of tools. And we look forward to you know, continuing to expand that. Great, so let's uh, go right to the next question. Next question. Next slide. Thank you. Yes. Is the real action for us in schools? Um, I think there's always an assumption that, in fact, that's the easiest audience to serve. Um, and just a couple quick facts on that regard. It turns out that up to the age of 18, um, you have about 105,000 waking hours. Even while you're in school, you're only in school for 15,000 hours. And in fact, of those 15,000 hours, you're lucky, you're lucky if you have 1,800 hours of science instruction. So what the heck are we doing with the other 90,000 hours that you're not in school as a kid and the other 310,000 hours that you're an adult, waking hours? So is the action in the schools or not? That's like Go ahead, that. Allison. Um, so I think action in the schools is critical. Uh, we definitely need to move towards a more ocean literate public and in order to do that, we need a strong foundation uh, in the classroom. Uh, but, as you said, there's a lot more opportunity outside of the classroom. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about telepresence. Uh, many of us are very involved in telepresence activities from sea. Um, some of us you know, have very large uh, efforts towards that, and some of us are just kind of beginning to get video on ships and streaming, uh, but it's critical. Um, and it's enabling a transparency to the process of ocean research, to a window of who's on board and who's making that happen that just hasn't been there before. Um, so that's 
very exciting, I think, as an educator, um, as a scientist. It's just having a transparency to the process, open data, it's a really fantastic thing. Um, public venues like the Exploratorium, uh, National Aquarium, you know, tapping into those resources uh, from sea through our research uh, with Ocean Exploration Trust uh, from the Nautilus. We're doing over 1,500 interactions with uh, informal venues while we're at sea. So there's a huge audience that's there, um, and they're really excited and engaged. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, citizen science activities like Beth brought up earlier, um, you know, following the leads of some really great efforts that are already out there like Zooniverse and Galaxy Zoo. Um, you know, all those efforts are kind of paving the path and allowing us to kind of follow their great lead. Um, and a lot of other, I will also, you know, speak to kind of the social media efforts that a lot of people are engaged in. So I know like Julie Huber is very active in tweeting when she's at sea. Um, and that's just using the pre-existing networks that are always already in place. Um, and it's really tapping into how people find their information now. Um, in 2010, I think Pew Research did a pretty interesting study where they polled undergraduates and how they get their news. Um, and they quoted one undergrad that said, if it's that important, the news will find me. And so if we use that, you know, and seek them out rather than waiting for them to seek us out, it's, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna tap into a much larger network. Lily? Yeah, I just wanted to add that there's a lot of emphasis on um, educating children, and I think that's very important to make sure our next generation is informed, but we are at a crucial moment right now, and we need the entire public, including adults, to be literate and informed about what's going on in the oceans. So um, I'm an artist, as you mentioned, and my audience is generally a humanities audience, um, so the image you see here is a gallery exhibition that I had with um, some of my paintings of marine invertebrates. I mostly paint deep sea marine invertebrates. Um, and you can see that, um, so the, what's happening in the photograph is a panel, a panel I organized in conjunction with my show. So um, I had three of the scientists that I'd been collaborating with uh, leading up to the exhibition, speak about their work. And almost everybody in the audience is a non-scientist. Um, and I think that what representing these marine invertebrates can do is um, create awareness of biodiversity and get people to ask questions about what's really out there. I think that everybody actually has a hook into the ocean. Like, it's not that hard to get people excited about it. What we need is to make sure that knowledge is accessible to all kinds of people. And so, you know, variety of the, is the spice of life. If we can get people surrounded from all angles, not just visiting aquariums or museums, but through the humanities, through art, music, um, poetry, an unnamed uh, scientist here uh, brings poets to see. <laughs> <laughs> We've been banned from mentioning him. Um, but uh, so there are all kinds of ways to reach audiences besides just traditional routes. Obviously, documentary, TV, all those um, mass media platforms are great, but um, interdisciplinary uh, activity creates a story and demonstrates that non-scientists can engage in this scientific world. So let me push you guys just a little bit harder on the same question, uh, sort of as a systems point of view. Um, if you really look at, for instance, the, the hundreds of thousands of hours that are going into school reform and how complicated and regulated and full that system is and everything that you're trying to accomplish during those school hours, and we only have so many resources, so, many, uh, so much energy that we can put into the system and thinking of the formal system being probably the most uh, heaviest uh, and most difficult to sort of move. If you had to prioritize audiences, um, who, who would you go after first and why? Parents. Parents. We can't leave it entirely up to the school system and the schools to educate our young people and make them ocean literate. As someone pointed out yesterday in one of our discussions, I'm not quite sure who it was, that Someone had set up an informational website uh, destined for schools to help support ocean literacy in schools. And in fact, the primary users of the website were parents, helping their kids with their homework, trying to get a little bit ahead of their kids so they could actually help them with their homework. 
So I think that it's a, the action may be with the next generation, but it isn't necessarily limited to the schools as, as a venue for this. And someone said Khan, I don't know who it was yesterday, but Khan Academy is yeah. the one that all the parents are, are using. Um, I would say just from my limited example, I have a, a six-year-old who's in kindergarten. They don't really have, that I've seen, any technology in the classroom, like, you know, at least in his, iPads, computers, doing demos. Um, and where I teach him is at home. So, you know, we use YouTube. He loves underwater dinosaurs. Um, we have a, a layer that we've worked with Sylvia Earle's foundation on. They've curated with lots of contributions from in here that's all education, and you can search on their foundation site. And I'll use that at night to like teach him about the oceans. And you know, he loves things like gray white sharks and um, poisonous jellyfish. And you know, his litmus test is video. Like if you show him a photo, he's like, no, this doesn't play. It's broken. And I think, <laughs> and I think it's very telling. Like you know, a six-year-old, you know, his interest and in how to engage him. I think it's at least my my little sandbox example. Uh, and I think though, if you can make tools really easy to use, and maybe um, apps are a future thing because he he plays iPad apps all the time. Um, I, I think that, that you can create creative ways that can you know, support what the teachers are teaching in the classroom. And, and actually, I've gone into his classroom um, when he was in Google Preschool and given talks and like, bring it to them that way. Um, but you know, in an ideal world, we'd have actually required ocean curriculum right, in the school system. But that doesn't exist, so you have to do informal ways, I think. Richard, last wing. Yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's about media and influencers. Um, we put all our, virtually all our resources into influencing the media um, because it's the best way of, of communi communicating out to a, a mass audience. And to do that, you've got to be extremely professional. You need to hire the best people with the best contacts uh, to then get out to that mass audience. And when we talk about media, it's not just traditional media. Um, looking at, you know, obviously, our partner with Google. Google is a media. Um, we've got three million um, followers for our project purely because of using that, um, that media that platform. Fantastic. I would Great. add Paul. educators in there, too. Okay. I mean, it's just, you know, it's critical. <laughs> There's a huge uh, void of ocean science and curriculum. Uh, luckily, with the new science standards that have just come out, um, there is actually mention of the ocean um, in the curriculum. But yeah. it's, uh, it's still, the average person has a basic understanding at a sixth grade level. Um, and we can't have policymakers be you know, judging policies as a okay. sixth grade. Okay, I am going to stop here. Because well, yeah, <laughs> I see everybody getting charged up. We're going to keep moving through the questions. Next slide, please. Um, did Cousteau have it easy? Who wants that one? Um, yes and no. Um, I think he was a, in a unique position um, to reveal the underwater environment uh, for the first time, really, um, through the power of television. Um, but he didn't have the tools that we have available today, which make it even easier. The problem we have today is there's certain baggage that we have, um, whereas I think Cousteau did a, a brilliant job um, at the time, but it was a very, very professional approach, and we need that same approach now. Kim? Cousteau had it easy because he had technology that allowed him to share the oceans with the general public. And he was also a really good storyteller. Wasn't much of a scientist, but he was a really good storyteller. And I'm here today because of Cousteau. I grew up in the middle of the Canadian prairies in Saskatchewan when Cousteau's National Geographic specials were coming on television. And I was glued to the television every day. And I decided by the time I was 12 years old that I wanted to be an oceanographer. So that, that you know, I'm not saying that one, one little impact like that is, is, is critical, but what I think we have new tools today that we can, that can do essentially the same thing that Cousteau did, but share the oceans with the public in a much broader and, and diverse and instantaneous way. We don't have to wait for the, the film to be edited and assembled and put together in a National Geographic special, as we'll be talking about earlier. We can live stream, we can use social media, we can get people engaged. We have access to this technology and in this imaginative way that Gusto did, we need to use those tools to tell stories, to get people intrigued. So let me, t let me pick up your point, Kim, because I think it's a very good one, which is um, you had a very emotional connection that brought you sort of in. One thing we understand about learning is that there is an emotional component, uh, um, component to it. Uh, I mean, somehow you get hooked on it. Somehow it touches you in some sort of personal way. And of course, for so many people, oceans are much more remote than, let's say, the cosmos and the sky. 
So how, how do we really, um, I mean, to watch a lot of data flying by, you know, bits of information or sort of long-term, you know, uh, uh, data um, frames, where do we bring the emotional component back in, or, or at least the best way to understand about learning theory? Um, I don't know about learning theory, but one thing that we've been trying to do is we have this sort of Google Earth and surround display that you walk into, and it's like large panels. It's called the Liquid Galaxy. And we've been donating them to uh, museums. So we donated one to this pictured here is the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco. And um, you see one of uh, Richard's uh, divers um, with a pole cam, and that's one of the underwater street view cameras. And we've been putting ocean content. So there's tours that we work with scientists on with Google Earth where you fly around the ocean and, uh, and learn about it. There's like a Cousteau tour that flies to different snippets of his films. There's also all the underwater street view imagery in surround. And they, um, they told me it's their most, like one of their most popular exhibits. They have long lines. They're trying to figure out how to you know, make it more accessible to more people. Um, I, think, uh, I think it can be really powerful. People walk in and they find their house and that's their like reference point. And then they can then go and explore the ocean and see tours. And, and I should say the additional thing we've been doing is um, Google Plus lets you do Hangouts on air so that you can, anyone can join your Hangout. So you basically become a live broadcaster and then it gets saved as a YouTube video. And so Richard and I, we've been working on these Hangouts with his divers actually on the reef and then projecting that into Plus and then doing Hangouts in the Liquid Galaxy with with him, with explorers like Bob Ballard, Don Walsh, Sylvia Earle, and they really tell the story and bring it to life. And I think that is, again, another powerful tool, like kind of trying to bring all of these things and interpret them for a large, you know, educational museum audience. Yeah. Richard? Yes, I mean, 99.9% .9 of people don't dive and probably never will. So we need to give them a, an immersive experience that really touches them. And to do that, you need to have, well, technology is now there to, to do it. It's about creating that, that full experience. So it's the sound, it's the attention to detail, it's the layers of information. And, and we're there now. Um, we, can, we can do this and we can roll it out. It's just a, a case of actually doing it. OK. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so um, what can we learn about uh, engagement from the other disciplines? I mean, it strikes me, for instance, that um, often we sort of imply, if not make explicit, that part of the communication education challenge in the ocean sciences is to move people from understanding to action. Um, but for instance, I noticed that, in fact, there's no uh, health or medical uh, professionals here. And I would argue that health and medical professionals may know more about how information and behavior interact um, than most of us uh, in this room. So who, shall, who else should be at this table? Am I answering? Yeah, yeah go for it, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do mention the arts here. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here, and uh, that's partly because of, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, story, well, Kim mentioned storytelling, you mentioned an immersive experience, uh, Dennis mentioned this emotional connection, and I think all of that is really key in inspiring people, and that is sort of the job of art, the ideal um, successful artwork uh, is all of those things. It's immersive, it tells a story, and it creates an emotional connection with the audience. And then on top of that, um, Wendy Schmidt brought up something really interesting, which is her ray of hope for change is human nature's desire to ask questions in this inquisitive aspect of all of us. And the job of art is to, um, contemporary art, is to make its viewers think and, and ask questions. And um, viewing art is not a passive activity. That's sort of the distinction between that and watching TV. It's an active engagement. So um, somebody looking at a painting is supposed to actively engage with that painting. Um, so I think that is something that art actually shares with the kernel of science, what drives science. And so um, that's part of what's been so wonderful about being able to collaborate directly with scientists, um, because we, we share that desire to inspire curiosity in our audience. And uh, this image is from being at sea with a Scripps um, expedition. Um, and during that expedition, somebody on the ship had the idea for me to use the sediment that we were um, bringing up from using the multi-core. Um, so we 
were sieving out uh, this fauna, and then each day we were on the ship, I would use the leftover sediment to make a painting of the fauna that came from that core. So this is a painting of a seratulid, and then the next day I would wash it off and make a new one. Um, so that sort of interaction, just on a personal level, was great. Um, Removable graffiti, nice. Right, right. <laughs> Street art at sea. So, so what other disciplines uh, should be at this table? Well, for me, I would love to see more advertisers. I'd love to see more <laughs> PR people. I would love to see sponsorship managers. I'd love to see corporates. These are the people we should all be talking to and getting ideas from. You've only got to look at some of the examples out there, such as, um, you know, right down to sports. They are run so professionally, they've got lots of funding coming in because they have a clear mission. They are well branded. They use the best communicators. Um, and this is what ocean science, in my view, should be doing. Um, it's got a great, great mission, and it should have great, great support. Yeah. Okay. So how much time do we have left before the... Uh with, with 15 the, minutes. 50, oh, okay, so we should probably open this up, but let's get to one last question, and I'll give you, Allison, the first whack at it. So let's go two slides forward, if I could. One slide, two. I'll read the one more. Oh, there it is. Okay, so is it easier to train scientists to engage the public or to turn great communicators into ocean enthusiasts? Allison? Uh, I'm going to dodge it a little bit by saying I think it's a happy medium between the two. Um, I think we definitely need informed communicators, um, and we also need to empower scientists to be better storytellers. Um, there are a lot of really charismatic uh, and really wonderful storytellers in our community, um, but I think you know, we could all be better served by improving and honing in on our storytelling skills. Yeah. But, but how do we do that? Wish it to happen? No, I think we, we involve uh, more communicators. I think a lot of people are starting to take videographers to see with them, and they're very well trained at you know, framing and capturing the stories. Um, and so it's, I think it's a variety of mechanisms and tools that people use. So let's uh, ask uh, you guys uh, for questions. What, do you, what questions do you have for this panel? Several over here. Yes? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Hi, John Racanelli, the National Aquarium. Um, I, a couple of the people on the panel and others in the room here have heard this, 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 uh, this, this treatise that I've been on to here, and I want to ask the panel specifically about it, which is that um, this is a room full of knowledge experts. This is a room full of people who, who, who are pursuing important things and who are, as the knowledge experts, are, are determining the importance of the things they have to tell. But the interesting challenge that we face, and we see this in, in, in managing a, a, a large public serving aquarium, is that the marketplace, which means the, the public, or what we used to in the bad old days call the unwashed public, determines the relevance. And so, you know, when I think about the, the, the way we're all trying to, trying to make ourselves more relevant in terms of social media, in terms of earned and, and owned media, in terms of uh, free choice learning, we, we are constantly looking for ways to do that. And as I'm sitting here through these last two days, I've been thinking, how do we create a higher level of relevance for what's being learned here to this public that only 30% of whom have even taken a college level science course in their lives. So that's my question for the panel is, is, is how can we make this, this important information more relevant to our public? And for me, it's a single-minded motivating mission. Um, if you're clear about what everyone is doing and you filter the, um, the information that, that goes out to the, the public, then you'll have support. Um, the problem is we've got so many different messages going out about what's important, what's, um, what people are studying. Um, it's not clear, um, in my view. So it's just making sure it's clear and motivating. Well, I think it's a little, more, a little bit more complicated than that. I think there are a lot of different messages going out because there is a lot going on. And it is a challenge to get the public to feel empowered that what they do um, actually impacts this world we live in. Um, so I think creating an emotional connection, um, 
making people aware of the extensive biodiversity that's out there because people connect with other life forms, but then also um, geothermal activity. I mean, that's sexy, like making the ocean, like the ocean is glamorous um, and it's exciting. It's this um, space of intrigue and mystery. And to get people excited about that, I think will um, bring bring forward a curiosity and action. Uh, I, I Jennifer? One other idea, um, prizes. So this picture is a picture of Sylvia Earle winning the TED Prize in 2009. And um, you know her TED Prize wish was to save more of the ocean into protected areas and engage the public. And that, from after her talk, someone, uh, uh, Addison Fisher, donated a million dollars um, right away. And the whole TED community really got behind her wish, it led to the Ted Galapagos trip um, with a ton of people on it. It had huge ramifications of like people coming in to fund things around the ocean, like support for the NRDC Arctic, the creation of the Ocean Elders, the um, creation of the Ocean's Five Alliance, the Sargasso Sea Alliance, um, and a bunch of other things. And I think um, prizes like uh, Wendy Schmidt, uh, the Acidification X Prize, I think prizes can inspire people to get behind and be creative about solutions. And you're all about kind of working towards a mission. So that could be one potential tool to engaging a larger audience. OK, next question. Uh, P. Gerges, Harvard University. I'm kind of back here. Oh, I guess. there we go. <laughs> um, I have a question and then a comment. So my, my first question is, um, uh, growing up, uh, there was, um, you know, I had a healthy, dose of, a healthy dose of boredom in my life, right, like many of us. You know, you sit around at night and it was either kind of watch Jacques Cousteau or, you know, a rerun of All in the Family, right? And so, you know, as a kid, I was, you watch Jacques Cousteau. And I have to say that there's something about, you know, how, how packaged that was and how almost exotic it was that completely captured my attention, right? And so my question to you all is we live in a day where, you know, students are saturated, they're just like saturated. The, pu the public is saturated. There's, you know, there's ocean sciences. There's there's space sciences. You know, there's reality TV, which I still don't get. But the, but there's just this huge, huge kind of influx of information. Much of it is really exciting. So how do we distinguish ourselves in that landscape? That's yeah. the question. The Look brief comment, and I'll keep it short, is that I I love to speak to the public about what I do. Uh, I would like to see my students trained by professionals, right? And I, that's my challenge to this group, is how can we uh, provide our students with the opportunity to be trained professionally with engaging the public, right? Not just sort of winging it. So I'll leave it at that. Great. So I'm going to toss this question over to Jennifer, because I think this point that John Delaney made yesterday, too, the one thing about Jacques Cousteau is one-way transmission. And you were the passive recipient on the other end of that transmission. And I do think there's something that does connect up back to the data that we're producing here and that question of interactivity. And this may be a perfect time, Jennifer, just for you to share your quick demo and talk a little bit about it. Um, I mean, what, what has made Google Ocean um, so popular? Uh, I think, and I should oh, see if that works. Plug demos. Um, I should say that um, that Google Earth is uh, uh, is um, has been made possible for Michael Jones, uh, who's here in the audience, and he's been along with Eric Schmidt, uh, John Hankey, and Brian McLennan, a big sponsor of this project. I think uh, what I wanted to show real quick, as far as engaging, um, I've seen a lot of people use Google Earth to engage with the public and start to tell stories about the ocean. Uh, so I think since it's a free consumer product in 37 languages, it can be a part of the story for communicating. Um, and I guess I just wanted to say, you know, uh, I think one of the powerful parts of it is that you can start at a place that you know, like your backyard, um, and then you can go to places that are remote and you feel like you have, here we are in Waikiki, you feel like you have a starting place. Um, a sort of like reference point for what, for most people, the ocean is distant and far away. Um, so that's, uh, we have 3D models of places like the Royal Hawaiian where we just were. Um, and I think uh, then you can, though, go offshore and fly underwater. And this is the uh, Luihi Seamount, which, as I understand it, will be the next uh, Hawaiian island in a million years or something like that. Um, and I think, um, I'm not showing it right here, but you know, there, there's topography of the seafloor, which is a start. Um, like I said, Sylvia Earle's foundation you know, has worked on this sort of education layer. 
Um, and if the internet were working uh, as well as one might like, you'd see little blue circles with videos and stories from many scientists. And, um, and then I wanted to point out that you know, the map of the ocean we've built is from many of the people in this room. And where we have re high res data, much of it from the Columbia, uh, working with the UNOLS fleet in red, and the University of Hawaii, around Hawaii right here, I'm in the center of the screen, um, in Bari and CSU Monterey Bay at the California coast, NOAA, um, and scripts for the global grid, and many, many, many others. I think it's, it's a potential tool in the toolbox. I think for, um, we're gonna go now and show uh, Charlie Paul's beautiful data uh, from the FALCOR, which we published um, a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, what you can do is you can fly underwater, take people to these places, and then what we'd like to do next with, with Charlie is you know, some of what, in his beautiful talk, he said, um, put in little snippets of his story. You know, people have about a three minute attention span. So putting in little three minute clips um, and then telling a story, bringing it to the Liquid Galaxy, bringing it to YouTube. I think um, as far as teaching people how to engage, I think YouTube can be a really powerful um, tool, like the Khan Academy has been using that. Um, and I think uh, you know, teaching people, showing how people have improved lessons learned, like how you can communicate more effectively um, is one thing. Um, you know, w before a TED talk, you know, Duarte Design will go through a TED person's um, talk slides, make them more impactful, help give feedback on how to make that conversation more engaging. And I think, um, I think those storytelling sort of components can be taught and learned. And I think it's just, you know, it, it just needs, someone needs to drive it. Go ahead, Kim. The tools help. But I, back to, to Pete's uh, question of earlier, you know, why would people even want to listen to us and, and pay attention? And I come back to something I mentioned at the beginning here is transmitting this, this message of urgency to the public that why should we be worrying about the oceans? Why should we be interested? Okay, there are cool organisms, there's cool geology, all sorts of interesting things that if you're a little bit science oriented, you'll, you'll naturally gravitate to. But if you really want to interest a broader public and you're, commun and you're competing with a lot of other sources of information, from everything from reality TV to Cousteau reruns. I think the way to capture people's attention, and this is not just a trick to compete with other groups, because I think we all agree in this room that our oceans are in trouble, and it's going to get worse before it gets better, and without an informed public, without informed decision makers, we're not gonna get very far down that path, and I, I think we can use that as a lever to get people's attention, then that's where these tools come to bear. That's where we call in the ad man because we have a very clear message to get to the public, and we need help getting that message across as, as efficiently as possible. Great. You know, we actually um, are the group that's going to give you guys the most time to ask questions because we were misreading the timer and finished our prepared questions uh, a few minutes early. So we have uh, 24 more minutes here, and there were a lot of questions out here, so let's keep them coming. So uh, I'm back here. I'm David with Open ROV, and this is, this is obviously our favorite um, topic is, is how do you communicate this? Um, one of the ways that, that we found is, is through stories. You know, we had this story of this underwater cave that we wanted to explore. But what we've quickly found is that you'll run, up, you'll run into a wall if all you're doing is telling stories. Because you're, you're competing with, you know, so much amazing that's happening on the internet, that's happening everywhere. People are inundated. In order to really break through, I think you have to invite people to be part of a broader narrative. And you have to enable them to tell new stories about themselves. And I think, that's the, I think that's the big challenge here, is, is to figure out what that new narrative is. I think Jacques Cousteau had, did it right. He, you know, he said, this is, we live in this amazing world, and you should get out, and you should explore. And he invited all of you, probably, to be a part of that narrative. And I, and I think we've got to think about who's coming after us uh, and what the narrative is that we want them to be a part of. Um, and that makes me think, when you talk about narratives, um, I, one of the most effective organizations I've seen in doing that is WildAid. You know, they have worked with celebrities as an engagement tool, you know, Yao Men on Shark Fin Soup, and you know, they've, been, they've gotten like, big ad buys in China, so it reaches you know, through their TV networks a lot of people, and they've used professional like, ad producers to make those ads, and they've been really effective in reaching a huge number of people and changing people's minds about Shark Fin Soup. So I feel like if you can follow that, you know, that's one recipe. I think film is another. I feel like Inconvenient Truth was really amazing at getting people you know, aware of what was going on. Um, 
you know, as a start for uh, climate change. And I think, um, you know, as a, as a response, you know, an outcome of Sylvia's Ted wish, you know, they're, they've um, made a film called Mission Blue that's going to come out. And I think that is another tool, you know, as far as like reaching, you know, people through, through film, like, you know, professional storytellers. Yeah, so beyond storytelling, what else should we be um, relying on more? I'm thinking this is a natural segue into our last side that we, in fact, forgot to show. Do we not have a who's doing it right? Right. Yeah, Bye. so good. provide some great examples. Go ahead, Kim. Okay. Could we? Oh, sure. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So well, I think I'll start by defining the it in, in, in this sentence here. The, from my point of view, what is the it? It is using all these tools that we, we've talked about to, to communicate with the public, to share our knowledge of the oceans with the public, particularly online and social media, etc. And who's doing it right? I, I think that, well, first of all, what does doing it right mean? I think we, we can't just assume the fact that if we connect online and make material available to the public, that they will come. I think a lot of us, and certainly myself, from personal experience, when you, if you go to sea with a vessel and you start streaming live video from an ROV, you can't expect everyone to drop what they're doing and, and tune in. You have to build your audience before that. You have to put a lot of work in, into preparing this in, in advance. And I think groups like the Ocean Exploration Trust know how to do this. Perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about how you go about building your audience prior to these events? Sure. Um, I mean, it's, it's been a long time in the making, you know, with Bob Ballard streaming live from sea. Um, and we, of course, take a lot of people to see with us through telepresence. Uh, many of you have been involved in our Doctors on Call program. Uh, so we have various audiences um, that we build, and you know, we sometimes have 50 scientists following one cruise, you know, asking for samples while we're diving. At the same time, we're pulling in questions from second graders in Puerto Rico about, you know, from their classroom. So it's, we have a large audience, and I think one of the magic ingredients in it is the interactivity. Um, somebody sends a question in, they hear somebody answer their question within minutes. And um, I think one of the other ingredients that's really critical is the role models. Um, everybody that steps on board Nautilus becomes a role model to somebody. Um, and we don't just put the scientists in the limelight, we put the scientists, the engineers, the ship's crew. Um, everybody has a career on that ship and anybody watching could fill any one of those roles. And so I think that role model, you know, yeah. Putting that out there is a really important. Yeah, I, th I think the last thing I'd put on the table is we have a lot more work uh, and opportunity to do in scientific visualizations. Uh, I mean, there's sort of this sense that if we put the learning objects out there, we put the data out there, it becomes sort of intuitive for people to use. And of course, everything we know is, is, is not at all. But we are seeing things that, you know, the thing I always love to re uh, refer to is the old, remember the old wired info porn page? You know, where they're able to get, you know, like 10 or 12 variables on that page, but you could still, for most of us, figure out what was going on or spot the interesting patterns and data for yourself. Um, and now that you know, we have these kinds of tools, the opportunities to show more than just A causes B or get an X, Y axis up there, but in fact to really bring lots of different variables in these very complex systems like oceans and let people play with the visualizations themselves. Who are our visualization makers? You know, who are, where's the community that can really take a lot of our data? Uh, and really turn it into really spectacular, powerful, and intuitive um, visualizations that, um, uh, that everybody can play with, not just the in crowd. It could be even simpler than that by making, you know, giving access to the public. People can pick things up and, and, and run with it. This, this picture we have here up on the screen is a 14-year-old boy who lives in the Ukraine. And secretly to his parents and also unknown to us at, at Ocean Networks Canada, we have a number of underwater cameras online uh, down to uh, 2,000 meters depth. And this kid was, in his evenings at home after doing his homework, was going online, knowing our camera schedules, and actually recording the video live over the internet from our cameras, and he set up his own YouTube channel called World of Ocean, and he had been saving videos and, and essentially assembling them by category. And he had like 30, 35 views in the several months that he had had. And then one night he saw something strange. And he was sharp enough to recognize it as being unusual. And he contacted us on our information line on Monday morning we came into work and realized that what he'd seen was at 1,000 meters depth, 
a hagfish come swim into a field of view, and a female northern elephant seal come in and suck up the hagfish and swallow it. So this seal had dove a thousand meters to the seafloor, saw our lights come on, said, oh, food, and came over and swallowed up this hagfish. And so we decided to, to take this and run with it. This is a great example of personally motivated citizen science, not a program that we put together in ourselves that, that was maybe stuck to a rigid formula. So we decided to, after contacting his parents, to publish a web story on this. And within six weeks, he'd had over two million views on his uh, YouTube channel, and it just keeps building. But he's done this on his own. You know, we gave him a little bit of help, a little boost. Yeah. You know, he's interviewed by Radio Free Europe, et cetera. But, uh, yeah. So it's the, it's the ocean equivalent of having a kid have an asteroid named after them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, next question. Oh, can we? I think that's a still. Sorry. Yeah, that's just a, <laughs> that's just a screenshot. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to play devil's advocate, and I caveat it by saying I'm not only a big fan of human dimension science, I've actually published some papers recently with them to the horror of my natural sci scientist friends, um, and I'm a big believer in PR and advertising, and I, it, I think it's exactly right that there's a science problem, there's a communications problem, there's a governance problem. That said, devil's advocate is ocean literacy or education even, of any part of um, the U.S. national population really the problem. I've agonized over this a lot. I have some very good friends, uh, Catherine Hayhoe, a Canadian, commented to me once very clearly on the difference between the U.S. and Canada when she moved here from Canada, climate scientist, IPCC author. Um, we're living in a country where 50% of the people uh, basically are in some sense climate science deniers. 50% of the people think evolution is just a theory or whatever they want to say. What's the difference between the U.S. and Europe, between the U.S. and Canada, with the U.S. and almost every place else? I agonize over this a lot. It suggests that access to information, education, is not actually the problem. There may be something more fundamental. Yeah, you know, it, it's a great point. You know, to think of it on the policy and the action side, it always surprises me that um, uh, I guess those who aren't in the policy world don't realize that it's a small numbers game. You don't have to win the whole population to get your policy through. There's probably, you know, eight or ten people in each one of your specializations that are actually making, you know, the most important decisions for, for the whole country or the whole world um, and knowing who those people are and, and identifying those influencers and really getting to them uh, uh, matters a whole, a whole lot more. And so I do think there's other ways to think about governance change and policy changes that isn't about getting 51% of the population to believe in your message. Um, but it is a fabulous question, you know, to the rest of the panelists, you know, what, uh, is it uh, something endemic about the American culture that says we should just stop trying? Well, I think that, I believe Marsha touched on this in her opening remarks, that um, citizen science could be a, an answer to that. People don't have a problem with weather. People believe weather, it's verifiable. So um, if it's not such, if we don't focus so much on a top-down message, but inspiring critical thinking and inspiring, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but inspiring curiosity, I think that is the key. And I think that um, great science comes out of, from an outside perspective, comes out of dialogue. And um, not just setting a goal and going towards it, but opening up to exploration. And so um, to that end, I think that what we need from the public is um, a way to uh, get them curious and um, and it, it capitalize on the fascinating quality of the ocean because I think it's easy to fascinate people. Uh, um, as I understand, there aren't any required ocean curriculum teaching standards, and although there's the California environmental, you could teach that, that you know, you're not required and you're not tested on it. So I think changing that, um, which I would assume would take a lot, a lot of time, so I think in the interim, again, like Khan Academy, like how about an like an ocean channel or something like that. I mean, go directly to parents uh, and then apps. You know, people spend all this time, there are all these educational apps. If you made it really easy, so a teacher could be like, yeah, we're gonna do this in our classroom and that'll teach blah, 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 and they learn, you know, some basic math or something, uh, then you can kind of maybe sneak it in there. Allison? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is the lack of the education. I grew up in Tennessee, so I mean, I grew up in one of the places that didn't have access to ocean education or really a great science education. 
Um, so I think it is, I think it, it does come down to what's in the curriculum and what really needs to be put into the curriculum more. Okay, so I'll be the devil's advocate on that point. Uh, most people don't know this, but in fact, the United States scores in the top two on the fourth grade uh, science test, which is stunning because we don't teach science in elementary school anymore since No Child Left Behind. So there's very little, you know, sort of science at all, but we're still like number one or two uh, in terms of science learning. So where does that come from? Where does that come from? And I would argue, partly because of the National Science Foundation, that we've had one of the most robust informal science systems anywhere in the world, whether it's media and the magic school bus and NPR, or whether it's what's going on right now in our technology world uh, and all the information coming over from places like Google or, or others. Um, I mean, we know, for instance, that there's 15,000 informal science institutions in this country, and they actually bring in somewhere close to 300 million people a year, more than all professional sports in live stadiums on an annualized basis. So are we looking under the right rock? Okay, Dennis, yep. Dennis yeah. uh, why don't you take one final question, if you would, please. OK. Where's the uh, microphone? Mike, yeah. Co Mike Coffin. Yeah, Mike Coffin from the University of Tasmania. Kim's slide there is actually a good introduction to what I, I'm thinking about, which is linking yesterday and today. Yesterday, we talked a lot about platforms and vehicles, but there's one major category which we didn't talk about at all, and that's a vehicle that does not require any capital expenditure, no maintenance expenditure, and no operational expenses, and that is the fellow members of the animal kingdom. The elephant seal is one of those, and it's particular, it's my favorite, because it can dive to over 2,500 meters. Now, I work mainly in the Southern Ocean where elephant seals are routinely instrumented, We've got 120,000 profiles that seals and penguins have collected across the Southern Ocean. These have been shaped by millions of years of evolution. They're perfect platforms in, in an evolutionary sense in that respect. I guess my question is, it seems like use of these animals, which was originally to understand their ecology, but now we've found out that they're great ocean observers. In fact, Australia has incorporated them into its ocean observing system is there seemed to have been a peak in this use, and now with animal ethics regulations and other impediments, at least in the more developed countries, use of these seems to be declining. And I'm wondering, in the collective wisdom of this room, is this a trend or is this just an anomaly that we've got to stop using, using or employing these animals to collect oceanographic data? And that links in with this group, we have Obviously, <clears throat> someone said yesterday, no one wants to grow up to be a robot, but there are dog people, there are cat people, we could have elephant seal people, we could have penguin people if you bring them into an immersive environment. Can we use fellow members of the animal kingdom to help people relate to ocean science? And they're actually teaching us things about ocean science. Or what about invertebrate people? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's uh, broaden our view away from just the charismatic megafauna. Look at the charismatic, what is it, mesofauna? <laughs> um, because there are, I mean, all of those benthic creatures, there's everything in the ocean is really strange and really beautiful. And um, I think it's a great idea to, you know, use that to connect people. Absolutely. Or even hagfish people. Yeah. We heard from Kirill Dutko last week. He's contacting us. He wants to become a hagfish biologist. Can you imagine a more vile creature in the, in the ocean? I don't know if ever, any of you have ever had anything to do with a hagfish, but they are really unpleasant things. And, but they're he was beautiful. so fascinated, not by the elephant seal that ate the hagfish, but he sees more hagfish than elephant seals. And you know, there are other ways to use animals in the ocean to, to, as tools for communicating. We don't have to necessarily capture them and glue um, data packs on their backs. We can just use them as spokesmen for what we're doing to help people discover different parts of the ocean environment. Hagfish are one, are one example. We've certainly uh, seen other people use uh, penguins to discover fisheries in the Antarctic. We all talk about how whales travel through the ocean. We're not about to capture a whale and, and, and strap a data pack onto it. But there, there are other ways to use animals that don't necessarily get us in trouble with, with the animal rights movement. Richard, you got the last, last word? Well, for me, it's, it's media gold, um, whether or not you uh, agree with it or disagree with it, it is extremely valuable for communicating ocean science. Likewise with aquariums, um, yes you've got captive animals but they are hugely important in, in engaging people with the oceans.
Yeah. So I guess if there's a final message from this panel, from all of us, uh, it's that there's this whole other community out there who's actually paid and make their lives and their careers out of translating really complex and important science for the rest of us. Um, and so use us, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Dennis.